you're going to start seeing more and more governments start viewing Bitcoin as a strategic asset because of the fact that it's decentralized and nobody controls it. That's just going to drive more value in it. And we're going to continue to see more Bitcoin just being held and liquidity getting tight, um, which is just going to do a positive thing to the price. So we're kind of open to all sorts of opportunities and looking at places as far afield as Africa even for opportunities to bring Bitcoin mining as a way to take advantage of stranded energy while also helping develop infrastructure for communities and, and cities. We sell the Bitcoin that we produce enough to cover our operating expenses and then we hodled the rest. If Bitcoin were to go on a tear upwards in price, yeah, we may reconsider and say, you know what, we're not going to sell any Bitcoin um, because it makes more sense to hodl. So it's literally a discussion we as a management team have almost weekly. Introducing bids to the Blockware Marketplace. Select from dozens of different ASIC models. The Marketplace shows you the highest current bid, the lowest asking price, and the most recent sale price. Use this information to set a competitive bid. Once you're ready, input the amount of BTC or USD that you're willing to spend, the quantity of machines you want to purchase, and then hit bid. Once a seller accepts your bid, you'll receive an email notification. Click the link attached and send BTC to the prompted address. After six on-chain confirmations, the machine will be yours and mining rewards will instantly be directed to your Bitcoin wallet. Get started today at marketplace.blockwaresolutions.com. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Blockware Intelligence Podcast. This week I have on Fred Teal. Fred, welcome. Thank you, glad to be here. Yes, glad to have you. Uh, I wanna start out uh, strong. What is it like managing one of the largest publicly traded Bitcoin miners in the world? Uh, well, it's an exciting challenge, obviously. Uh, two years ago, a little over two years ago, I guess April of 2021, when I took over as CEO, I was employee number five, and today we're approaching 50 people. Um, and you go back to kind of middle of last year, and we were at pretty much zero exahash of hash rate capacity, and here we are at well over 23 exahash right now. So it's been exciting. Um, you know, it's doubly exciting um, in that you know, we've had to go through a pretty challenging time in 2022. Um, and you know, the market has come back nicely this year, which has been great. And just the fact that Marathon's a public company, you know, adds that much additional level of scrutiny, um, has its advantages, obviously, from a capital raising perspective, but it also has its challenges. So it's a, it's a lot of hard work, but it's not my first rodeo um, and you know, I've been able to build a really good team. So I'm very proud of the team that we have and they're doing a great job at executing our plan. So it's been really exciting. Yeah, I bet. When you originally started, did you expect 2022 or, or periods like 2022 where the market spe specifically for Bitcoin was just really tough for, for miners? Well, Marathon was kind of born, you know, in as a mining company in 2017, which you know was pretty much winter um, at that point. So having been through lots of cycles just in the tech industry, I've been in tech for 40 years at this point. So uh, you see these cycles come and go. I lived through the whole internet boom bust cycle, internet 1.0, um, been through a lot of these kind of uh, cycles, the PC cycle originally, data networking, you know, there's an initial hype, then there's a crash, and then it's kind of things grow again, then there's another kind of crash, and then things cycle. Uh, with Bitcoin, it's been more of a, uh, you know, people tied very much to the halving cycles. Uh, you know, I have a belief personally that Satoshi, uh, he, they, them, uh, or she, when it was initially conceived, uh, the four-year halving cycles just happen to coincide, interestingly, with liquidity cycles in the global economy. And I think that Bitcoin's price moves more in line with global liquidity today uh, than it did in the past. And you know, when you think about it, miners today produce 900 Bitcoin a day in the way of um, block subsidies. And you know, that 900 Bitcoin a day is not going to move the market a whole lot. So that's stock to flow supply you know, theory doesn't really fly at this point, I don't think. I think it's more now driven by liquidity cycles and institutions investing in Bitcoin. And so as you look back at 22, what happened? Well, there was a crash in liquidity. 
uh, you know, risk off became the mantra. And so people sold out of Bitcoin. And here we are, uh, you know, in 23, and you've seen kind of risk on, especially around tech stocks. Uh, this year, Bitcoin's benefited from some of that, but also Bitcoin is changing its correlation. It's, you know, decoupling from gold, it's decoupling from equities, it's kind of living its own life. And we've been in this very stable kind of low volatility environment with Bitcoin for the past, you know, couple of months. And I think it's going to be interesting to see as the Fed eventually gets to pausing and, you know, eventually starting to lower rates, uh, you know, global liquidity is just going to increase with what's going on in China. Uh, definitely. Uh, Bitcoin has an inverse correlation to the dollar, and we're going to start seeing the dollar decline here as the U.S. pauses and other countries keep increasing. So I, I think, you know, a lot of positive, um, you know, tailwinds for Bitcoin, hopefully, and uh, that'll be great coming into the halving, and then we'll have to see kind of what happens next. Yeah, absolutely. You had an interesting tweet that I I didn't realize until I saw it. I think it was this morning about how global or at least U.S. or global household wealth fell last year. And that was the first time that's happened since the 08 financial crisis. So do you think, I guess, the worst is behind us? And, you know, last year was actually historically an extremely bad year uh, for financial markets. Well, I think... You have to look at a couple of things. The average American's net worth is tied up in their house. Uh, you also have to realize that that's a baby boomer thing. Um, as you move past boomers into uh, Gen Y, Gen X, Gen Z, uh, home ownership decreases pretty substantially. And so now, where is that net worth going? Well, they're spending the money on things like travel. They're spending the money on experiences. And they're investing that money. And the markets were really down in 2022. So I think what you're seeing is, uh, you know, between retirement plans, et cetera, um, home values, you know, that went backwards last year. Some of it's come back, but it's been very sector specific. I think the challenge is going to be more for, you know, the younger generations today. How are they going to build net worth where my generation, I'm a boomer, um, you know, my generation built its net worth around, saving money, buying a house, and seeing the equity value of your house grow, well, that's going to get much harder. And especially now with mortgages at over 7%, it gets really hard. I mean, you know, for my kids to buy a house, it's really difficult. So um, I think it's going to be a challenge, but it's really going to be uh, up to the younger generations to figure out um, how they're going to live in a world where, you know, interest rates are just going to be higher. You know, the past 10, 15 years have been really attractive from an interest rate environment um, for people, provided great opportunities to invest. And now we're going to be in an environment where 4 to 5% is kind of where interest rates are going to sit. And so what does that mean from a person's ability to invest and what sort of returns are they going to be wanting? So, you know, there are benefits and, and drawbacks to um, higher interest rates, but it's just a different psychology that you have to approach the market with. So. Yeah, that's a really good point. I can definitely relate to the housing topic. I graduated from college in 2020, and I don't see how people my age can afford, you know, a half million dollar house, which is basically like a normal house nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about mining. I <clears throat> I know Marathon is obviously famous for historically doing the the massive PRs of like, hey, we just bought seventy thousand ASICs and whatnot. How do you think about Bitcoin ASICs as like assets? Like why hold ASICs themselves? Well, if you kind of think back to, you know, last year and the year before when we made these big purchases, it was a different environment. It was a shortage of ASICs available. So ASICs had value, right? If you think the peak of the market in 2021, you know, dollar per terahash, pricing of miners was, you know, between 50 and $80 a uh, terahash, depending on the model of miner. You know, today we're looking at seven to 20, something like that. Um, so then, you know, there are three constraints in our business. When you think about mining, it's access to power and hosting, uh, access to rigs, ASICs, and then access to capital to pay for both of those. And in 2020, 2021, it was access to capital was pretty easy, so people were growing. So what was difficult? Well, it was access to sites and built, getting sites built, and it was access to rigs. And so we figured if we could corner the market on rigs, then all we had to solve for was access to sites. And so that's why we bought a lot of miners and um, 
you know, it took us a while to get all those miners placed, but, you know, they're fully installed at this point. Today, I think it's a very different market. You know, today the, the issue is access to capital. There's, you know, it's much harder to get access to capital, so it means it's much harder to grow. You also have a different class of miner coming into the market today, where before it was mostly private or public miners. Now you have sovereigns coming into the mining business. You have, you know, governments actively going in. Um, and, you know, most of these, you know, you look in the Middle East, you look in uh, other places in the world, you're seeing governments actually, you know, going in and supporting mining, uh, which is going to be a, a different world because they have different pockets, they have different capital sources, and they typically also control their own energy costs. Uh, governments are looking at Bitcoin, uh, you know, not to displace their other uh, reserve holdings, but as one of many things they use for holding reserves. And if you're a government, and you've lived through the kind of weaponization of the US dollar, one of the things you'd be very concerned about is if you're holding Bitcoin, you wanna make sure you also control some form of Bitcoin mining so the Bitcoin you hold can be transacted in the event that there's some form of prohibition uh, against uh, you know, Bitcoin that you happen to hold being traded. So that's why you wanna be a miner. And most, more importantly, you wanna most probably operate your own pool so that you can get access to uh, the global markets that way. So we see kind of the biggest competitors going forward are going to be sovereigns and you know nation states coming into the Bitcoin mining space. But it's super exciting what's going on in the market today. Uh, El Salvador's bonds, um, I tweeted something the other day that, you know, basically now these bonds are returning up to 70 percent yield for some of the investors. And even JP Morgan and large institutions are investing in what before were viewed to be you know, who would ever want to buy Bitcoin bonds? Well, now it happens to be a thing all of a sudden. So I, I think we're going to start seeing a shift here uh, in how mining kind of operates. Uh, it's going to be really an industrial institutional business. Yes, there'll still be some specialized miners doing specialized things at smaller scale. But I think it's really up to, you know, bigger, high, large scale miners who have the ability to do things at scale. Um, that doesn't mean that a miner like Marathon is only looking for large sites with hundreds of megawatts. We're actively looking at lots of small sites also because we think that there are ways to mine Bitcoin using landfill gas, methane gas, which is really good for the environment that we can convert that methane into energy and, and sequester that methane because it's 80 times more damaging to the environment than carbon dioxide is. Um, so we're looking at small sites. We're also looking at, you know, large sites with partners like we have in UAE, uh, where, you know, we're able to help balance and stabilize the grid there, uh, very effectively for the grid operator there. So we're kind of open to all sorts of opportunities and looking at places as far afield as Africa, even for opportunities to, you know, bring Bitcoin mining as a way to take advantage of stranded energy while also helping develop infrastructure for communities and, and cities. So, Yeah. That's awesome. On that note of, of governments and sovereigns getting into Bitcoin, did you ever read or I guess hear about Jason Lowry's uh, software thesis? Absolutely. Of... I, I have a copy of it sitting on, on my <laughs> desk at home. And uh, I understand it's become a rare thing now that it's been yeah. <laughs> taken off the, uh, the Amazon bookstore. So, um, but yeah, now listen, it's a... Uh, when you think about the value of Bitcoin as an a strategic asset, right? Um, it's not controlled by government, um, which means that the only way for Bitcoin to truly be, um, let's just say, restricted is if every government in the world were to uh, restrict it. And that's not going to happen. And so Bitcoin f fulfills a very important role for different types of countries, depending on their stage of development. In the case of underdeveloped nations or developing nations, uh, you know, you can look at places like Africa, Turkey, Nigeria, where um, Bitcoin plays a huge role in providing a safe haven for people to store uh, their uh, wealth, if you would, or even just their assets. Um, if you look in more developed countries, uh, like in the US or in Europe, um, you know, it's a store of value. It's an alternative investment. It doesn't fulfill a um, it doesn't give people necessarily freedom uh, because there already is freedom in how you can move assets around. You don't have current capital controls today. Uh, someday you may, who knows. But 
what it does give you is a very attractive return, at least if you look at the numbers over the past two years, 10 years, you know, Bitcoin has been a great performer as an asset. So it fulfills different roles for different categories of people. But if you think about soft war, that's really about national security. And if the U.S. were to push all Bitcoin mining offshore and really push Bitcoin offshore, they have no way of controlling it like they can with the dollar. Right? The U.S. dollar uh, has been fully weaponized with this Ukraine crisis. And that in and of itself is a challenge for the U.S. because now people are looking for alternatives. You're seeing the um, large commodity producers like the oil producing nations are not buying uh, U.S. Treasury bills or holding assets in dollars as much as they used to in the past. Countries like China, India, Russia, the BRICS are looking to do trade in non-dollar denominated terms. And it's not because they don't believe in the dollar as an asset. It's of strategic importance for them not to be controllable by the U.S. government. And so they are looking for alternatives. Bitcoin is a great alternative as an asset for countries if they want to hold their wealth in something because nobody prints it. It's limited to 21 million. We've already mined, you know, 19 and a half million more or less um, Bitcoin. And it's totally decentralized. And if you mine Bitcoin yourself and you operate a pool, you're kind of into, you're an independent operator and nobody can control you. So I think you're going to start seeing more and more governments start viewing Bitcoin as a strategic asset because of the fact that it's decentralized and nobody controls it. And I think that's just going to drive more value in it. And we're going to continue to see more Bitcoin just being held and liquidity getting tight, um, which is just going to do a positive thing to the price. Yeah, 100 percent. Completely agree. On that note of, you know, mining and, and holding Bitcoin, how do you guys at Mara think about what you do with the Bitcoin you mine? Obviously, you have you know, a ton of operating expenses. Um, how do you and I know you have like also one of the largest Bitcoin treasuries for public miners. How do you think about what you do with all of the Bitcoin that you mine? So we approach it from a perspective of um, our weighted cost of capital. So uh, what is it when you think about if we're going to raise cash, we can raise equity, we can get debt, uh, or we can sell our Bitcoin. Those are kind of our three basic things. Um, and so when we look at it, we say, okay, if we sell a Bitcoin, um, what does that do to our, the value of our company? What are we doing relative to creating or destroying shareholder value? So if we hold a Bitcoin and instead use debt or equity, what does that mean from a dilutionary perspective to our shareholders? And what does that do to the value of each share um, compared to selling Bitcoin? Now, in an ideal world, most of those scenarios say that you should not sell your Bitcoin. You should either dilute your shareholders or use debt. Um, you know, we learned definitely in the last cycle um, that that most probably isn't the best way to go about it, that it's really more to approach it as a miner. Um, and this is, you know, as a company who produces Bitcoin, it's more like in the oil industry, oil producers, right? Um, think of it that we sell the Bitcoin that we produce enough to cover our operating expenses, and then we hodl the rest. And so we're creating shareholder value with the HODL, but we're not diluting or destroying shareholder value by necessarily using debt or raising equity to cover our operating expenses. You know, we've gotten to that place where we now generate more Bitcoin than it costs for us to operate. Where if you look last year, you know, we weren't producing a whole lot of Bitcoin and we still had operating expenses. So we had to uh, you know, use uh, equity to cover our operating expenses. But today we're past that point. So now we're you know, able to operate more like an oil company. We produce Bitcoin, we sell enough Bitcoin to cover our operating expenses, we haul the rest. Now, if Bitcoin were to go on a tear upwards in price, yeah, we may reconsider and say, you know what, we're not going to sell any Bitcoin um, because it makes more sense to haul. So it's literally a discussion we as a management team have almost weekly. It's what do we think Bitcoin's going to do? What should we do? And we make a decision and, you know, we uh, hopefully are making good decisions in that regard. Yeah, no, that's awesome to hear. Do you guys, I guess, think about it in terms of trying to outperform spot Bitcoin itself? Um, well, it depends on how you want to view that. All right. Um, so when we sell Bitcoin, uh, you know, we're try we our benchmark is kind of a VWAP of um, the price of Bitcoin over the course of the month. And, uh, you know, 
how could one have done better? So we're constantly tweaking how we do things. Granted, there are um, some strategies that you can do things that, that help you do a better job at that. And, you know, we are, we now have uh, an individual on board who's responsible for all of our digital asset management, who does nothing but manage our Bitcoin uh, that's generated. And when we sell Bitcoin, um, because again, like you said, we have a pretty large amount of Bitcoin on our balance sheet and we're trying to optimize that at all times. Um, but I think it, it's really a, a question of, uh, you have to kind of look at, um, you know, mining is always a great way to generate value, uh, in Bitcoin as, you know, um, Warren Buffett famously, uh, was reported to have said that, you know, I'll never buy gold, but I'll invest in gold miners. Um, the same thing kind of applies in the Bitcoin world. Uh, you know, if you want real beta, then you invest in Bitcoin miners and you can just look at it this way, you know, how much is Bitcoin appreciated this year? How much of Bitcoin miner stocks appreciated this year? And, you know, Bitcoin miners have outperformed Bitcoin, yet they're in the same business. Well, why is it? Well, Bitcoin miners generate, um, you know, margin in what they're doing and their cost to acquire a Bitcoin, if you would, is less than that of just buying it spot. Now, when the market goes the other way, yeah, the volatility hits you on the downside too. So, um, you know, I think you tend to find that when the market is on the way up, you have a lot of people who are, you know, they invest in Bitcoin by buying equities in publicly traded mining stocks. And, you know, we're blessed with that. We have a lot of vol share volume that trades every day, you know, tens of millions of shares a day. So it's a very liquid stock. So it's very easy for people to get in and out. And therefore, we have a lot of shareholders who basically invest in Marathon instead of buying spot Bitcoin. Sometimes it's funds because they can invest in equities, but they can't invest in spot Bitcoin. And sometimes it's just individuals, you know, like you or myself, um, who, you know, if they want to hold Bitcoin, uh, how do they want to hold it? You know, because we hold so much Bitcoin on our balance sheet, uh, we're a really good proxy for Bitcoin, more so than many other miners who just sell whatever they produce. Right. So you can look at our valuation as being the amount of Bitcoin we have plus the amount of cash that we have, plus our underlying assets, where another miner would be just their underlying assets, their cash, and that's it. So that Bitcoin that we hold, um, you know, adds kind of uh, juice, if you would, to the valuation of the company. So it's something that we're really very protective of. Yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. What's your view on air-cooled mining versus immersion mining? So I think it's very dependent on um, the environment you're mining in, right? So for example, in UAE, you know, average temperatures are well above 90, up into the 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, 50 degrees C, you can't air, run air-cooled miners um, effectively in those temperatures. Uh, so you have to use immersion. Um, immersion has other benefits. It makes the miner operate more reliably because the temperature is fairly constant. It's not constantly going up and down in temperature as air-cooled miners do. Uh, the miners aren't getting dirty and full of dust like they do when they're air-cooled because you're pulling all that dust through them. Um, so we believe the total cost of ownership using immersion is better than that of air-cooled. Um, but there is an additional capital expense to invest in the immersion technology. Now, with our UAE installation, um, we kind of went all the way and said, okay, how do we make this really efficient from an operating perspective and lower the total cost of ownership? And so, um, you know, total cost of ownership is includes things like how many engineers do you have to have on a site? How often are you touching miners? What's their uptime? And so with our UAE installation, we did a pilot late last year there where our site ran for over a hundred days before an engineer had to touch anything. And so uh, as we look going forward here, one of the reasons we operate our own pool, um, which we've now developed uh, from the ground up, our own firmware for our miners, our own controller boards, our own immersion technology is kind of similar to Apple. We control the whole ecosystem and we can tweak it, and dial it in perfectly. So going forward, you should expect us to use a lot more immersion technology just because it's better. But yeah, there's some places, uh, you know, if we were to operate in, you know, the Northern Europe or, uh, you know, the Southern tip of uh, South America, um, you know, would we need immersion? No. So we would most probably run air cooled, but there are ways to run air cooled in those cooler climates where you can mitigate for some of the dust, et cetera, things. Um, but, you know, it's really very site dependent. 
Yeah, very interesting. Um, this is more of a question around regulatory stuff and I guess like the ongoing narrative of Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining to people that may not be in the, the space. Do you think we've seen a narrative change or we're starting to see a narrative change around Bitcoin mining? We saw like the ESG report put out by KPMG basically saying like, hey, Bitcoin is actually an ESG asset. Do you think the narrative is changing or what are your thoughts there? Hey, everyone. This week, I want to talk about Stamp Seed. This is very cool metal plate where you can literally stamp your Bitcoin seed phrase with this hammer that they sell you into this metal plate. This is a must have for all Bitcoin holders. If you have taken self custody of your Bitcoin, you wanna make sure you've recorded your seed phrase on something that is fireproof, waterproof, and time resistant. This is a great product for Bitcoiners who have taken self custody and want that extra level of security and resiliency to store their Bitcoin. So if you are interested in this product, definitely check out stampseed.com. Use code BLOCKWARE15 for 15% off the entire website. Well, uh, we live in a world where anybody can put out a piece of news and if people click on it, it gains traction, right? Thanks to Twitter or X or whatever we call it nowadays. Um, and certainly, you know, the internet has been a great fomenter of the ability for anybody to be a news source. And just look at how fast rumors go around. And especially in the crypto world, um, Twitter or X is kind of, you know, the hot news spot to go. And if somebody puts something out there, uh, it spreads pretty quickly before somebody can finally squash it and say, no, 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 that's not true. So rumors spread very quickly. Um, now, the media has obviously uh, in 2022, you know, when the markets were headed down, crypto was kind of on its back feet. And then you had these the Celsius issue, the three arrows capital, FTX, et cetera. It was easy to bash Bitcoin and crypto. I think the narrative has changed now for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, when an asset starts going back up in value as much as Bitcoin has, it's kind of hard to argue that it has no value because obviously people are investing in it, right? So you start getting some people sitting on the fence saying, well, maybe it is something we should be looking at in a more positive light. And so people start writing about that. You also see the bifurcation uh, of Bitcoin and crypto, right? The narratives are changing. Crypto is DeFi, it's altcoins, it's you know um, all about staking, bridging, things like that. And you can quasi say things that are built on Ethereum. Uh, when you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin, it's kind of like digital gold. It's this store of value, you invest in it. It helps people in underdeveloped nations hold their wealth and carry their wealth with them. Uh, in ways that are pretty unique because it's the only fully decentralized cryptocurrency out there. I mean, you can't argue, you can't say today with a straight face that Ethereum is fully decentralized. Um, if anything, it's gotten much more centralized. And so I think there's this bifurcation between Bitcoin and the rest of crypto. And um, you're also seeing stable coins kind of being carved out. So now, in, as opposed to just talking about everything as crypto, you have Bitcoin, you have stable coins, and then you have other things, right? DeFi, et cetera. And so you're seeing in Congress, people now finally having been educated and sort of studied this, you're seeing staff members and members of Congress uh, taking a, a position that's not just, oh, crypto is bad, we got to squash it. Uh, meanwhile, I think you still have in the executive branch of the current administration, um, maybe because they were the single biggest recipients of money from FTX or for whatever reason, uh, that, you know, they need to kind of take this hard stand on crypto and the SEC's position on crypto, um, you know, has been, most people would argue, pretty overreaching. Uh, and I think you're starting to see that kind of becoming to dialed back. Even the media is starting to have a more even handed approach to, to Bitcoin and crypto now. And, you know, clearly, listen, when people like Larry Fink and, and BlackRock start saying they're going to do uh, an ETF for Bitcoin, now you're talking about some Wall Street heavyweights that, um, you know, carry a lot of gravitas with what they're saying. And, you know, institutions continue to build out infrastructure for Bitcoin holding custody and trading, you know, companies like Fidelity and others. And so I think you know, you're going to continue to see Bitcoin march on and uh, it's going to be a long march. 
Um, and because it's so decentralized, you don't have this one kind of galvanizing person or entity that's driving things. And so that's why you see this more organic advancement uh, in the world of Bitcoin. But I personally foresee that, you know, in the not too distant future, we'll see a lot of really interesting applications and use cases developed on top of the Bitcoin network because it's the most secure network and it's fully decentralized. You'll see it as a truth of source. And especially with the development of all of these uh, LLMs in the AI world um, that uh, are biased. Um, and, you know, there's been research done by universities that show that, you know, the different LLMs out there have different biases. Um, they need a truth of source, which is verifiable. And, you know, storing data uh, at uh, layer two or as a side chain that's secured using the Bitcoin blockchain has a huge opportunity for people to be able to say, well, you know, truth of source, source of truth, this data is valid, right? Because it, it's been validated and it sits on a blockchain that we can validate against the Bitcoin blockchain. So we know it hasn't been altered because LLMs, you can actually bias them from the outside without them knowing. Because think about it, they're scanning, they're ingesting data from the internet. Well, if you on a particular topic start posting a lot of content, um, you know, these LLMs will start ingesting that content, which could create a bias for them. And, uh, you know, I don't believe any of these LLMs today have the moderating tools um, that allow uh, for moderation in a way that uh, most people would prefer because they move so quickly. And, you know, they are at the end of the day, black boxes, right? The only way to reset the bias is to unplug it, reboot it, start it again. So it learns from scratch again. Huh? Yeah, it's quite fascinating. Um, looking back on 2022, you know, we saw FT, FTX collapse, Celsius collapse in a, in a weird or in a way, do you think that was healthy for the market? Like I'm thinking if Bitcoin had gone on to 100,000, 200,000 back in 2021 and FTX became a you know massive organization, it's almost better that we had that extreme volatility to you know eliminate a lot of the, the frauds and the weak hands. And then now we can finally move higher. What are your thoughts on that? So, I mean, this is why um, the so-called Gartner hype cycle kind of uh, is called that. Um, in the early days of any industry, there is a lot of optimism and it's all about doing and building uh, with very little, you know, reflection on uh, protection and making sure that um, things are stable because it's a race to be the biggest. It's the race to be first. And just go back to Web 1.0 and, you know, the early 2000s, you know, Web Van, Web Grocer, you know. Uh, pets.com, all these things, uh, you know, they built out right idea too early, uh, executed maybe inappropriately, and then you had this crash. And then look today, you know, how to get people get their food? Well, they Instacart, DoorDash, right? Pretty much the same thing as Webvan was, uh, just different, right? Look at Amazon, right? Look at um, Petco. You know, all these companies doing things that crashed 20 years ago, but today they're well-established, stable businesses because they went through that kind of ringer of grow, grow, grow. And then, oops, here's all the downsides. So like with anything, you have to learn, right? Um, it's uh, one of the reasons we don't just develop a new drug and let people start using it. We have to go through trials. Well, in the commercial world, it doesn't work that way. With technology, it's, oh, wow, there's this cool widget. Let's put it out in the wild and see how it grows because we're so passionate about it. And anybody who says, well, maybe we should slow down, maybe we should see how this works, uh, is viewed as a naysayer. And that's why, especially in financial markets, it takes so long for innovation to happen is because the ramifications of releasing something um, potentially risky in the environment um, are very high and you know you look at the three arrows capital and ftx crash and you look at the connectedness and the interrelatedness of these companies and these assets and you know nobody was raising a red flag saying hey guys you know maybe we should restrict how interrelated these things are going because nobody had yet seen the problem and so you have to always go through this first wave of kind of it's a rush 
and we know it's going to crash on the beach and then let's kind of figure it out and sort it out so that the next set that comes in we can grab and do a better job at and i think we're in that second uh inning if you would of uh the game here and i think we're going to see a lot of really great companies get built over the next five to ten years as this industry basically goes through a similar pattern to the internet you know web 1.0 web 2.0 and eventually we'll get to web 3 whatever that ends up looking like yeah fully agree with there so i know we're about 250 days or so until the 2024 having where the block subsidy is going to get cut in half as a miner and a bitcoin holder how are you thinking about that well i looked at it in two different ways right so as a miner um, or let me start on the other side. As a Bitcoin holder, uh, the halving doesn't impact you as a Bitcoin holder because it doesn't do anything to the value of Bitcoin other than um, psychological scarcity. Because, oh, there's you're going to have the number of Bitcoin being produced from 900 to 450 a day. Um, as I said earlier, you know, 900 or 450 Bitcoin a day isn't going to move the market a whole lot, right? You, and miners could sell every Bitcoin they mine and they've been doing it uh, for the most part in parts of 2022 and uh, the first part of 2023. Um, and it doesn't really impact the price of Bitcoin. Uh, and if miners were to stop that extra 900 Bitcoin a day uh, isn't gonna do much to put the price up. As miners, however, the halving does have an impact because it means all of a sudden that your revenues are halved or your expenses are doubled. You can look at it two ways. <laughs> Um, cause you have to exert, use twice as much, uh, power to generate the same number of Bitcoin that you did before. So it really comes down to, uh, you know, your scale, your cost to operate and, uh, you know, what's happening with the price of Bitcoin. Now, if the price of Bitcoin doesn't move much from where it is today, um, a lot of miners are going to be, uh, in trouble. And you just can look at some of the recent research that's been done, um, around, the efficiency of different miners' fleets. And, uh, you know, the average miner out there, uh, the average efficiency of a miner out there is in the 33-ish joules per terahash. Uh, you know, our fleet operates today at under 25 joules, per, just about 25 joules per terahash. Um, and as uh, we continue to grow, it'll continue to drop uh, ever so slowly as our fleet becomes uh, all XPs or equivalent type machines. Um, so we'll get down to about 20 joules per terahash eventually, most probably until the next generation of machine comes and then it'll drop uh, additionally. But the guys operating at 33 joules per terahash or higher, they're not going to be able to operate profitably from the halving if Bitcoin is priced where it is today. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that basically you'll see 20 or 30 percent of the global hash rate fall off. And so what will that do? Well, it lowers the difficulty for the existing miners that are left. And so there's this continual um, uh, search for symbiosis, right? Or, or homeostasis, rather, sorry, that exists in this market that, you know, it's the beauty of the, the algorithm that runs the underlying network, which is it's constantly searching for homeostasis. And so uh, we're looking for that balance between difficulty, uh, compute power, uh, and Bitcoin. And I think that, um, you know, we'll likely go into the, the having with Bitcoin, you know, being somewhere between 30 and $45,000 a, a Bitcoin. And, uh, then if it follows traditional cycles, it will move up, uh, towards December or early part of the following year. Um, if it follows liquidity cycles, which is more my belief, then, uh, you know, I think you'll see a similar trend uh there uh and uh you know i think we'll we'll have to kind of see but uh we're certainly excited about the having we think it'll uh clean out the industry a little bit we think there'll be some opportunities for consolidation in the industry um which is one of the reasons why we're so focused on having a very clean balance sheet and a lot of cash and bitcoin in our balance sheet so we're able to take advantage of things yeah it's definitely going to be interesting to see you know what happens at the having um from a long-term perspective, where do you see Mara in 10 years? Wow, that is a long-term. Uh, um, you know, we kind of, our planning horizon right now is through 2028. So it's basically a five-year horizon. 
Um, yeah. I think you'll see Mara continue to kind of go down a very technology focused path, which will lead us towards some diversification. Um, I think uh, over time, uh, the key thing for Bitcoin, what's most important for Bitcoin and Bitcoin miners is that the transaction fees and the transaction volumes on the Bitcoin blockchain go up. And so we're certainly going to be very focused on doing things and bringing technologies to bear that will enable that um, such that people will want to do things using Bitcoin and on the Bitcoin blockchain and it layers above the base layer uh, or parallel to it such that transaction volumes increase because uh, we're getting to a point after 2028 where the uh, block subsidies um, need to be uh, you know, passed by transaction fees. <laughs> Uh, you know, Ordinals gave us a taste for it. You know, the, the big bump we had kind of in, in May and June, um, where all of a sudden, you know, transaction fees were greater than block subsidies for a day or two. But I think that the future for miners, if they're going to be pure play miners, they're going to have to do things that really make transaction fees uh, surpass block subsidies. And you're going to have to be able to live off your transaction fees. So there are two ways to do that. One is uh, have either zero cost energy, which is a way to do it. Uh, the other is to be doing things other than Bitcoin mining to generate revenues such that your Bitcoin mining has very little operating overhead associated with it. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot of different models come out of this, but we're, we're very focused on the long-term game of being long-term, uh, you know, a technology company that's focused on growth. And we're going to continue to focus on leveraging our technology assets and building more of them. Yeah, absolutely. You touched on this a little bit earlier, but can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the JV with UAE or in UAE? Sure. So, um, you know, bef when you go international, you always have what's called country risk, um, where you have to deal with potential risk uh, of, you know, you have a government that controls things and, you know, they can nationalize things. And especially in the Middle East, there's always this risk of nationalization uh, or regime shift. And so um, we believe that, uh, you know, the Gulf region has a very unique energy profile relative to their use of electricity, which is very asymmetric, you know, very uh, high demand in summer, very low demand in winter. And they have to keep generating all this electricity because for a lot of them, they use that the offtake from the energy generation as a way to desalinize seawater. So they have potable water. So they have reasons to keep their energy generation running, even though they're not consuming the energy. And so the question was, if we're going to go into a place like UAE, who's the best partner? Well, partnering with the sovereign is the best idea you could possibly do. And so, um, you know, we had a long period of kind of conversations and pilots that we ran, um, and they decided that we were the most viable partner for them to work with. Uh, on this deal. And so we put together a structure where they would obviously be very incentivized to making it successful. Uh, and so we designed um, the sites, we designed the equipment, exactly how it was going to operate, uh, and then formed kind of a joint venture. And the joint venture is responsible for operating the sites, building, developing, and operating the sites. And our partners and ourselves have contributed capital to do that. And then we share in the um, you know, the Bitcoin that's produced by it pro rata to our investments. And so it's pretty straight up, very simple model, um, but it allows us to really prove out the model in the region with one of the best partners you could possibly have because the partner, the same shareholders that own our partner control the power distribution, control power generation uh, in the country. And so um, you're kind of partnered with the best partner you could possibly have. Um, and what it does is it gives us kind of a great reference for doing similar deals in other nations in the region because, uh, you know, hey, if you can do it in UAE and do stuff with the sovereign there, then why can't you do it in Oman or Qatar or somewhere else? So um, that's why we kind of want to do it this way. Uh, it's also just a great way to kind of do the first international deal and see how it works. So now we're very focused on longer term diversifying our our operations. So we're about 50% domestic, 50% offshore, because we think there are you know, very attractive parts of the world where um, Bitcoin mining could play a very beneficial role from a societal and sort of ESG perspective. Um, 
And we think uh, there's great stranded power in lots of parts of the world. And we think over time in the U.S., uh, you know, we're going to go through a big transition in the U.S. where as we electrify, you know, vehicles, et cetera, uh, there'll be a need for more and more energy uh, on a more constant basis. Today, we have this unique uh, thing called a duck curve where, you know, we use very little energy from the morning to the mid-afternoon. And then we have spikes either early in the morning or evening and late afternoon. Um, as you electrify more and more things, that demand curve starts flattening. And when that demand curve starts flattening, uh, grid balancing using Bitcoin mining becomes less attractive and batteries become uh, more of a relevant technology. The problem is um, when we partner with a power company on the grid, um, we're making the investment in our infrastructure. If they use batteries, they have to invest in the batteries. And the biggest issue facing this country is actually not how much renewable energy can we build? It's transmission lines. The U.S. is so behind in transmission capacity that the wait list uh, to get a new solar or wind site uh, connected to the grid is huge, which means not a lot of these sites can get approved from a capital raising perspective. And so there's lots of stranded energy, and that will remain an issue until we build out more transmission capacity. And you may have seen a month ago, uh, you know, FERC, changed the rules regarding getting transmission projects approved. The problem is getting them built. We have a deficit of transmission capacity, which would require an investment in the nearly trillion dollar size. And the problem is the government's not gonna make that investment because transmission is privatized. So utilities are gonna to have to do that. How are utilities gonna raise the money to do that um, without raising energy rates to consumers greatly? So. I think the U.S. is in a bit of a pickle when it comes to how they're going to continue to electrify without having um, access to transmission. And what that will drive is more energy generation at the edge where it's actually consumed. So you'll see more commonly in places where it's practical, communities building their own solar energy generation, having their own batteries at community scale, which is much more realistic and economical than at utility scale. And then a small amount of Bitcoin mining uh alongside of that to monetize their excess energy and then they can essentially share energy with the grid when the grid needs it because yeah, communities cool. are already connected to transmission right so I, I think we're going to start seeing more of those models and less of this hub and spoke big solar farm big wind farm uh, nice yeah I, I feel like that's probably better for the world kind of decentralizing energy production just like we're decentralizing absolutely. money very mm -hmm. cool Last question, then I think we can probably wrap it up. Um, you know, Bitcoin's just been pretty not very volatile, which is very unlike Bitcoin, you know, over the last couple of months. You know, I guess, what do you think about this weird period that we've been in? And do you think it's going to end, you know, soon? So there's a lot of Bitcoin sitting in uh, strong hands, right? Um, and Bitcoin's not moving because people, when Bitcoin is stable and you have high inflation, um, it, it's a good place to keep your assets, right? And so people aren't trading it, if you would, because there's no volatility. Traders love volatility. Um, so as you see adoption grow, you're going to see more demand on liquidity, which is going to drive price action. And you're going to see more people wanting to invest in Bitcoin. And uh, eventually, we're going to get to a point where you know, very few people hold a Bitcoin, they hold Satoshis. Um, because Bitcoin's going to be, you know, at a, if you think about it today, there are roughly um, a million wallets that hold at least one Bitcoin in them. Right, that means somebody holds $30,000 in Bitcoin, forget about their other savings or assets, right? That's a million people hold uh, at least $30,000 of value. Uh, that's a pretty big amount when you consider the average American savings account is less than $4,000, right? So as that continues to happen, you're just gonna see more scarcity, which is just gonna drive more demand for price. So I think what you're basically seeing is a lot of people have a lot of confidence in the price of Bitcoin is gonna go up. They believe we're in a period of rising tides, the historical trends, if you believe that they're gonna happen uh, as they have in the past would indicate that the price of Bitcoin would go up. If you believe in global liquidity trends, then you would believe that the price of Bitcoin is going to go up. 
And with people like Larry Fink at BlackRock and others are starting ETFs, it's because they think people are going to want to invest in Bitcoin, which basically means that the Bitcoin price is going to go up. And so therefore you have people buying Bitcoin and just sitting on it, waiting for it to move. Yep. I like it. Fred, thanks so much for coming on. This was an awesome conversation.